Blog Talk Radio. You're listening to The Limo Show, presented by Town Livery. And here's your host, David Bastion. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Limo Show, coming to you live via the World Wide Web. My name is David Bastion, your host, bringing you The Limo Show each week on Blog Talk Radio. I encourage anyone out there that's listening to the live stream to call The Limo Show hotline if you have any questions for myself or our guest tonight. You can reach us at The Limo Show hotline at 714-868-0786. That's 714 0786. Today we are going to discuss the unique and interesting career paths that uh, some of our, our guests have taken, uh, and in particular our guest today, uh, before he found himself working in the limo livery industry. In preparing for this show, I, I wanted to get some inf- interesting information about career changes in people's lives, so I jumped online and I, I found some really interesting information. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the average U.S. worker changes careers three to five times during their lifetime. That's three to five times during their lifetime. That's absolutely amazing. The limo industry is a melting pot of people who have worked in unique and different industries before they became owners of limo companies or drivers. Some of you out there listening have worked as soldiers, teachers, Some have been reality TV stars, construction workers, politicians. I know that there are a few limo livery operators out there that played Major League Baseball and also professional wrestlers. All of our previous work experiences help shape and mold us to become the people we are today. We have a special guest on our show, and he came from one of the industries that I mentioned earlier. In the industry that he came from, He is very well respected, and he is also very well respected in the limo livery industry. He's known by two names. The limo livery industry knows him as Patrick Helvey, while the sports entertainment industry knows him by Rick McCord. I would like to welcome to the limo show, Patrick Helvey. Welcome to the limo show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, great, great. We're, We're glad to have you on. I'm going to play something here for you. Your old entrance theme there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, now, I remember that. <laughs> you do, definitely. Now, Pat is yes. the owner of Executive Cuisine Service in Roanoke, Virginia, and it's a company that you started in 1998. Uh, before we talk about your, your life in the uh, limo livery industry and uh, also your life in wrestling, um, I'd like to mention to the, to the listeners out there that you've been a champion in both of your careers. Your company That's has right. been recognized for, for many awards. Uh, you won the Roanoke Magazine uh, Best Limits in the Year 2007, 8, 10, and 11, so five years, five years in a row? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you were nom- nominated for the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Roanoke, the five-time Small Business of the Year Award. Uh, you won right. a Better Business Better Career. Business Career Torch Award. And you also were recognized as the Limo Digest Tap Business 2000 Small Operator of the Year Award. You built up right. a, quite a business, and you built up quite, I would say, since 98, a lot of hardware and awards for the limo company. Uh, what's been the secret of your success? Uh, just motivation and dedication to um, – to make it the best, to provide the best service that's possible. Uh, just like I'm in my wrestling career, was to give the fans the best entertainment that I could and the best athletic skills that, to my ability. When you decided to retire from wrestling, what brought you to mm-hmm. the limousine livery industry? Uh, my last long-term territory was Kansas City, and there was a limousine service that was in on one of the floors of the office for the wrestling promotion, and I started talking to him, and uh, I was getting near the age it was time to start thinking about doing something else, and I started driving part-time for this company in Kansas City. It was called Mr. Nick's. Um, Diane Forgey, 
Um, I met her on a cruise ship at the NLA cruise that we did a few years ago, and it turns out she bought Mr. Nick's limousine as she owns Overland Limousine. And, um, wow. you know, so it's, it's a lot of ways things reconnect like that, but uh, that, that's how I got started in it. And uh, the, Mr. Nick was pretty good about if I had a match. He didn't have any problem with me being all short, and uh, that was where I got my start. In your previous career as a professional wrestler, and you were known as Rick McCord to wrestling fans out there, you started in 1975, and uh, you worked with many of wrestling's big names, uh, and there was big names that, that we all recognize today and some wrestlers from your era, but I'm going to mention some of the names. You worked with Shawn Michaels, Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat. Uh, oh, you did? With Dusty Rose? Yeah. Uh, with uh, Shawn wow. Michaels and uh, Ricky Steamboat. Wow, and you also some of the other Cowboy people. Bob Orton? Uh-huh. That's Randy Orton's dad. Name some of the other guys that you've worked with. Um, I've, I've worked with um, Kurt Hennig, uh, DJ Peterson, um, Rufus R. Jones, Wahoo McDaniel. I've uh, tag teamed with Wahoo McDaniel. Uh, one good story about with him is he was famous for the uh, Indian shot, tomahawk shot. Yep. And yep. I told him one night, I said, I'm glad I'm, I'm your partner tonight. And he said, why? And I said, so I don't have to feel one of your chops. And I wasn't <laughs> aware of that they were having a battle royal the same night. <laughs> and uh, he got me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and those, those uh, chops are pretty stiff. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you get your start in professional wrestling? I started going to the matches when I was 16, but I always watched them growing up. And... A friend of mine that I met at the matches had a ring in the backyard, and we started um, working out with the matches on Saturday night, and Sunday we'd start putting our own show on, and all of a sudden we started drawing a crowd, so we decided, you know, we need to do this for real and start making some money with it, and I went for a tryout in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, it was a success. I got called back in a couple of weeks. And when you were a wrestler, were you considered a baby face or a heel? Uh, baby face. Can you explain what a baby, baby face, face is to the listeners? Guy. Yeah, the baby face is a good guy, and the heel is the bad guy. It wasn't my nature to be a heel. I, I tried it a little bit in Florida, and the fans still cheered for me, so the promoter switched me to back to baby face. Every time you you pretty much walked out to the ring, uh, the fans were cheering for you and, and rooting rooting for you and, and cheering you right. on. That always uh, yeah. just gets you adrenaline flowing. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Now, when you first started out, did you start out as a mid-card wrestler? And and how long did it take you to go uh, from being like a jobber to main event status? And can you tell people about those terms I just use and what they mean? Um, when a, um, a jobber is someone that um, is mostly inexperienced, learning, trying to, uh, to gain experience, and they're usually matched with someone with a lot of experience. You learn from that, but also you're pretty much beaten before you go in. But you you give it a draw, and if you have you know a good match, then the promoters will spot that, and they start giving you better matches yourself. But uh, sometimes you can be a good jobber, and that's your job to make the champion or the person getting the push look better. Um, give them a good match, and if they just pound you and slaughter you if they beat a nobody, but if they if you give them a run for the money, win or lose, you, you still um, make, make them look good. Um, when I started out, the first about the first eight months of it, I would re- wrestle the first match and then go back and put on the striped shirt and go out and referee some of the rest of the matches. Oh. And wow. uh, I wouldn't every night, but sometimes I'd do that in some of the smaller shows. And then... Um, my second year, I started getting in main events because I won Rookie of the Year, and that was in ICW. And I had main event matches with um, Randy Savage and One Man Gang, or Crusher Broomfield was the name he went by then. Um, and so that, that helped to give, get the early start of my career going in an uphill direction. And then, and then towards the end, you, you, of course, got the push to be a main eventer? Right. Um, the biggest surge, I, I traveled all through the lower half of the United States, all the way from Arizona to Florida. And um, 
a lot of the central states, but when I went to Kansas City, uh, Bob Geigel was a promoter there, and he noticed my ambition and my uh, desire and ability that I had gained in the ring. And I had left at one time, and it was the Batten Twins um, that were the tag team champions. Uh, they were really popular in the area. And I left and went to Tennessee, and Brad Batten got injured. So one night uh, there was the right timing, and I came back. Uh, no one knew that I was there, and um, I saw Bart out in a single uh, a tag team match doing a handicap. So I went out, and uh, he just started getting double teams, so I went out and um, just started to help him, and I just popped out. No one knew I was even going to be there. And uh, so it was with the um, – the um, I can't think of destruction. It wasn't a destruction crew. Um, the Mod Squad. They were the tag, mm-hmm. Central State Tag Team Champions. So uh, Bob Geigel came out and asked me if I was ready to come back. I said, yeah. And he signed us with the Tag Team Championship match, and the next week we won the championship. And that I was think I did see that. I think I think I think I did see that match on YouTube. Um, it was out there, and it looked like it was somewhat yeah. of a handicap match. Oh no, that was the one I had um, at a later time. Uh, unfortunately, um, Bart's brother came back and didn't like it because I had gotten the limelight with. They were identical twins, and okay. so he he jumped me one night, and of course his brother took his side. And next thing you know, that's that's where the handicap match came up, and uh, I see. Some cash came in, and uh, and he and I were better enemies in the ring and in the dressing room. We didn't get along at all. Uh, he just, oh, really? It was, yeah, he. He was more of the bully type, but one night we had it out and had in the dress room, gained his respect, and next thing you know, we're the tag team champions. And uh, we've been wow. friends ever since. That's great. So, you know, now, who decides, like when, when you mentioned before, when you got the opportunity to get the push, but in in generally with wrestling today and even back uh, during your era, who is the the person that decides to give a wrestler a push? Is it is it the bookers, the promoters, or a combination of both? A combination. Um, when I went to Florida to wrestle, Eddie Graham was um, the, the owner and the promoter of the Florida Championship Wrestling, and he had um, he liked my work and he asked me if I'd like to just stay there for a while, and I told him definitely because that's one of the places I would love to settle in. And it was probably about a month later is when he committed suicide on Super Bowl oh. Sunday. And so the, the new booker that came in and took over, Eddie was doing most of the booking too, uh, the new booker came in, brought his own group of friends in. And since I didn't have that relationship with the new booker, then it was time to go somewhere else. But So sometimes it depends on if, if it's a good booker. He's got his group of friends that, that he'll bring in because he knows he can make money with them. But um, okay. sometimes the promoter is more hands-on and just gives the booker, uh, you know, a, what would you call it, the assistant manager position line. You know, this, uh, well, Patrick, a lot of the territories had a booker that just handled all of it. I see, I see. We're going to head off the break, Patrick, and when we come back, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more about your wrestling career. We're going to get into a little bit more detail about some of the uh, championships that you won. And we're also going to talk about uh, your limousine company uh, when we head back. You are listening to The Limo Show here on Blog Talk Radio presented by Town Livery. Now is the time to get on board. If you'd like to ask Patrick Helvey a question, also known as Rick McCord, when we'll come back, we will talk a little bit more wrestling with Patrick and open the phone lines to you. You can reach us at 714-868-0786. That's 714-868-0786. You're listening to The Limo Show, presented by Town Livery, here on Blog Talk Radio. Are you looking to add an executive L town car to your fleet? If you are, call Town Livery. Town Livery is a franchise board, Lincoln, Chrysler, and BMW dealer, that specializes in selling livery vehicles nationwide. Town Livery is located in Buffalo, New York, and is able to ship your vehicle to you at an affordable price. 
So, when you think of livery vehicles, think of Town Livery. Town Livery can be reached at 800-730-3683. That's 800-730-3683. One-stop shopping at Town Livery. Would you like a marketing partner that not only understands marketing, but knows the transportation industry inside and out? Are you struggling to attract new customers, retain your current customers, or win back lost customers? If you find yourself saying yes to any of these questions, there's only one place to call. Call the marketing wizard of the limousine industry, Arthur Messina from Create a Card. Create a Card is the number one supplier of business cards, marketing supplies, and promo items to the limousine industry of North America. Contact Create a Card today at 1-800-753-6867. That's 1-800-753-6867 so they can help transform your marketing and advertising into consistent sales generating machines. You can also find us on the web at createacardinc.com. That's createacardinc.com. You're listening to The Limo Show on Blog Talk Radio. Welcome back to the Limo Show, presented by Town Livery, here on Blog Talk Radio. We have Patrick Helby here on the show, and uh, also known as Rick McCord, and he's our guest today. We're going to talk a little bit of wrestling with him, and we're also going to talk about his company, Executive Town Car Limousine Service. Patrick. I'd like to play something uh, that will bring you down memory lane a little bit before we get into the wrestling and talking about your business. This match is a one-fall TV time limit remaining. Introducing in the red corner, weighing in at 218 pounds from Salem, Virginia, the ICW Rookie of the Year, Rick McCord. His opponent in the blue corner, weighing in at 235 pounds from Sarasota, Florida, the ICW World Heavyweight Champion, Randy Macho Man Savage. And Randy Sanders' manager, Izzy Flapperwood, is with him. Patrick, what was it like to work yes. with uh, with a legend like Macho Man Randy Savage? And right off the bat, it was, uh, you know, you're definitely nervous and, and uh, you really hyped up excited about the opportunity, but he he was a, a great worker himself, and, and we had matches that, that just, they're total excellent memories. Um, he was he was very high-strung, and if you worked hard in the ring, he would respect you, and he would give you a really good match. If you were a cocky or a prima donna, something like that, he wouldn't give you anything, and he was powerful enough to control you any way you needed to. But we had some really, really good matches that, that were just memories that I'll never forget. And to get to have the chance that's to right. say that I wrestled him, it was just, you know, that's that's a great feeling. We're all going to miss him. When when I heard the news uh, that he had passed, it was just a sad day, you know, a sad day for everybody. Even the national media covered it. He had so many fans out there. Oh, exactly. Um, he, he was a definite superstar. And uh, he was a, a big, important part of his business. No doubt about it. You had appearances in, in many of the major promotions of your era. Uh, you, you were with World Class Championship Wrestling, Universal Championship Wrestling, the AWA, and uh, the most major NWA, WCW territories. And you, mm-hmm. you spent a lot of time in hotbeds such as Florida and the Mid-Atlantic. Can you tell us about some of the titles that you held? Uh, when you were with some of these organizations? When I was in uh, in San Antonio, which was a, a kind of a spinoff from World Class, um, it was called um, Texas All-Star Wrestling. And um, I had uh, the World Junior Heavyweight Championship there. And then when I uh, left there, uh went for it again, but it was the NWA version. And I won the NWA uh, World Junior Heavyweight title, uh, U.S. Junior Heavyweight title, uh, later, 
Bob Geigel up to, to the World Junior Heavyweight Championship because we issued challenges to other promotions with their World Junior Heavyweight Champions and only had one to respond. And so we had a match and determined uh, to make it the World Junior Heavyweight Championship, and that was the belt that I retired with. I also had the North American Heavyweight title, and that was with Universal Championship Wrestling. Um, that was um, a very pleasing feeling just to, you know, to be such a national title like that, too. Um, and I, I wrestled some of the best, Mark Starr and um, Port Chuck Cash was a couple of them that I, I battled off and on for that one. Um, and then uh, held the Central States Tag Team Championship on several occasions. And as I mentioned earlier, with Bart Batten and with Port Chuck Cash. So, um, it's it's been some really big names that um, good, good championship matches. That just it was a good feeling. The, the text I, I sit at home and watch them sometimes again, just just uh, going down memory lane. Oh no doubt about it. You mentioned that you almost got to work with Ric Flair. Almost. 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 If you go on YouTube, you can even see the the issue about it. I, it was in Memphis, Tennessee. I was on uh, TV doing the TV taping. And I was scheduled to wrestle Ric Flair, and I'm standing on the other side of the ring, and he comes out and parades around, and Jerry Lawler was doing uh, guest commentator uh, with Lance Russell, and as they, as Flair was parading around the ring in his road, then um, Jerry Lawler, back in those days, he was really cocky, and so he, him and <laughs> Flair got into it. And the director just come in and says, well, you might as well go on back to the dressing room. It doesn't look like the match is going to happen. And I would have left to work with Flair because uh, you know, that would have been another feather under my cap. But just to say that I have, it would have been great. In business, as well as professional wrestling, wrestling, preparation is the main ingredient, and it's also the recipe for success. As a wrestler... Practice and preparation is vital for you and your opponent, and you'd agree, because one mistake in the ring can cause serious injury and even death. As the owner of a successful limousine company, how have those preparation skills that you've learned in your previous profession helped you today? Um, the main thing is just dedication. Um, there's um, a lot of ways that you can – you can experiment out of the the normal and um, try new things. When I was in wrestling, we some people thought we rehearsed the matches. I've gotten the ring many times with someone I never set eyes on before, and they were in the other dressing room. So how are you going to rehearse the match? Um, now there's been times like Randy Savage's brother, Lincoln Lanny, Lanny Poffa. He and I would get to the matches early, and we would try different moves to. Um, perfect what we were doing before the fans got there. And that, you know, that's a little bit different. I, I learned how to do the flying cross body, climbing up the ropes mm-hmm. from the inside and turning back uh, just because I knew I could trust him to catch me. And, uh, yeah. and same thing in the limousine business. Is you just you have to be dedicated. And, and um, I, Last night I went to a business after hours. I, I go to every business after hours I can. I'm a member of seven chamber of commerces. Um, there, there's Networking, just um, meeting people, telling them you know what's, what you've got and what you do, and and um, and then when you present the product, just the same as being in the ring and presenting a good match. Um, same thing holds in both directions. Yeah, you definitely. I see you at all the uh, limousine shows too, shaking hands and attending the seminars, and and I I, I imagine that's been a big part of uh, you meeting uh, many of the. Uh, limo companies that you work with today? Right. I go to Las Vegas and to Atlantic City every year. I strongly believe that if you miss one convention in this industry, you're missing a whole year of networking. Because even oh, no if you doubt about them, it. each year, there's, there's different crowds and different people at, uh, at each one. So you have, to, you have to take care of everything on both ends of the country. No doubt about it. In the squared circle, psychology is used uh, to work the crowd, uh, to sell the action. When I say sell the action, uh, sell the story, let's say, going on in the ring at the moment. Paying mm-hmm. attention to the crowd and, and playing to the crowd is definitely an important part of wrestling. 
a few weeks, a few months back, we had Randy Bussey from Workforce Development Group on our show, and she mentioned one thing that that uh, has stuck with me. You have two ears and, and one mouth, so we can listen twice as much as we speak. The art of listening to your customers, to my cu- the art of me listening to my customers, is extremely important. How have you applied the skill, that skill, the art of listening to the, let's say, the crowd, applied it to your business? And, and that means and body the language, is, too, because you watch the crowd's body language, too. Right. And um, if, you, if you're a good performer in the ring, then um, you can work the crowd to where you've got them behind you, or if you're the heel, you've got them hating you. And my skills was being the baby face. You know, so I, I would um, I would do moves that I was confident with, and um, but it was ones that would make them stand up and scream. And same thing in the limousine industry is I've worked very hard to have vehicles that were uh, extremely nice, but sometimes even a little different or out of the norm. I had a PT Cruiser stretch limousine. I've got a Chrysler 300 stretch limousine. And uh, just and then Mercedes Sprinter. So those are the kind just a typical limousine service wouldn't wouldn't operate. So it makes us stand out ahead. In wrestling, I, I would use moves. I even created created a few moves that were um, they were really exciting. And once it was done, the crowd was just sometimes astonished. But then working the same way, and and you're you're working to the public. So you know you've got to. You've got to give them what they want, and great service, great cars, great moves, and and great outfits. <laughs> you know, oh, no it's, doubt. It's all part. I did the Chippendale gimmick when I was in Kansas City with the ripaway pants, and yeah. I could get in the ring, and and when I come out in sight, the crowd would start cheering, and then when I get in the ring, I would grab my waist like I'm getting ready to uh, rip the pants away, and I'd look yeah. at the crowd and it start screaming, and then I. would tease them for a second, and then I'd say, nope, not yet, and then I'd go to the other side of the ring. And then finally I'd do it, and then you got the big pop. So it, it was oh, it was really fun to be able to work the crowd like that. No doubt, and and like I mentioned before, I imagine that skill of, of learning to uh, analyze the situation has definitely helped you with, with your customers, and, and that's one of the reasons why I believe you've been so successful on the limousine end. Right. Patrick, how can listeners uh, find you on the web and uh, get in touch with you if they'd like to speak with you or book your limousine company? Um, you can go on to, um, if you go on to YouTube, you can find me there. And I've, I've got a, a basic site started with Executive Town Car Limousine. The email is limorick, without a K, at verizon.net. And mm-hmm. uh, you can check out my website, and it's, it's got a, a place where you can put in a submission form and uh, just, if you want to dedicate a letter to me or, or something, just uh, put it there, and it'll get forwarded to me. So, and and what is the web address and, uh, for the, uh, what's the web address the web for the limousine address company? It's etclimo.com, like executive town call, etclimo.com. Rick, I appreciate, Rick, I'm calling you Rick. Patrick, I appreciate you coming on I'll the show to today. One. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I appreciate you spending the time today to come on the show and talk a little bit of wrestling and talk about executive town car service. Um, I do encourage anyone out there that's listening, if you don't know Patrick, to give him a call. He's a great guy. I've known Patrick uh, for, I would say, at least 10 years. Met him at the limousine show. He's He's a great guy. He's got fun stories. Uh, that pertain to wrestling, and uh, Patrick, I I appreciate you coming on the show. Okay, and I I appreciate everything you've done. Um, you've pretty much um, introduced me as the wrestler in the limousine industry at the conventions, and uh, that helps bring back memories and keep the memories. And I I would appreciate you doing that too. Oh no and problem. And, 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 uh, and sometimes if you run into Patrick at the show, sometimes he's got some really cool pictures with him. He brought me uh, some pictures a couple shows back, and uh, and uh, he was showing them to everybody, and they were, it was just it was just great uh, taking a look at those pictures. I enjoy talking to Patrick because uh, I started getting into wrestling more so in the 90s, and uh, he was wrestling a little bit before my time, and, and I enjoy uh, learning about the past. Thank you again, Patrick, for coming on the show. 
Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. And thank you again for everyone out there that's, that took the time to listen to the Limo Show presented by Town Livery here on Blog Talk Radio. We appreciate everyone that comes on the show. We appreciate everyone that listens to the program. We will be coming to you just about each week here on Blog Talk Radio. So have a wonderful week, and I look forward to spending time with you on the next edition of the Limo Show. Wrestling fans, seems like every week we have an opportunity, thank you, DJ, opportunity to bring you an exciting new tag team here in the AWA. This week it's a new tag team, but they've been together before. We're talking about DJ Peterson, his new tag team partner, Mr. Rick McCord. DJ, tell us a little bit about Rick. You know, Rick McCord has been wrestling, I think, around 10 years now, you know? so there's no doubt that he has the experience to do what I want to do. You know, I should be bitter about all the things that the structure crew's done to me in the last three months, but I'm not. It's a very happy day. Got both tag team burger back and got surprise from the destruction crew. Now, you two have held titles together before, is that correct? That's right. We were the Central States Tag Team Championship. And I came here for one purpose. Dave needed some help, and I'm going to give it to him all the way. We felt the belt around our waist before, and we are going for it again. Destruction crew, you had better be ready for the battle of your life. All right. You heard from DJ Peterson, Rick McCord, brand new tag team here in the AWA, and they're looking for the crew.